Um, first, I think it's important to be very sensitive to how much exposure to the media we're having. And it's important to take a break. Uh, I hope people are able to work toward the goal of a whole day without being um, exposed to um, the news or social media, especially with regards to what's happening most recently. It's important to, to give our heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit a break from the stimuli of uh, information. We've talked about routine and, and structure, simple things like um, getting up at a particular time, going to bed at a particular time, designating mornings for particular kinds of activities or chores, designating afternoons um, in advance. Um, another recommendation is uh, engaging the senses. If we think about our five senses, it's important to have two or three things that we can do that engage our senses um, that kind of divert us from how overwhelming the anxiety of all of this can be. Hmm. And so simple things like getting outside and being aware of our five senses or um, you know, people are using um, oils or something related to a sense of smell or having something plush around in terms of touch, uh, trying a new recipe where, you know, you're, you're tasting something different. These are all ways of kind of reorienting our senses and bringing our focus to something other um, than the COVID-19 virus. The other thing is that deep breathing um, from the diaphragm in terms of inhale and exhale tells the brain to relax. Hmm. And very often when we're anxious or panicky, our breathing is very shallow and high in the chest. Uh, I also re uh, recommend increasing your connections at home and with at least five others. And there are different levels on which we need to connect with each other mentally, which means staying available to an openness to learn and discover, not just about the virus. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, which means a willingness to talk and trust and feel. Uh, my niece, who's a, a nurse, I had a conversation with her, and after the conversation, she, you know, talked to her husband, and they, they had a family time where the kids could just open up on, on where they're at, because they've got a mom who's, you know, at the clinic or at the hospital every day, and mm -hmm. she said to me, you know, one of my sons said it was the best part of his day, right? Just that willingness to talk and trust and feel and, and to learn what it means to provide empathy, that undivided attention, mm -hmm. consideration, and validating each other's feelings. Connecting on a spiritual level, we, we know that spiritual intimacy has something to do with faith in action. You know, your, your family may not have been one before this that took the risk of praying together or looking at a scripture together or, you know, singing together. And so um, in, in talking uh, about one's faith, it also means an availability to, to be vulnerable, uh, to take a risk, to invite a spiritual connection. Also, connecting is done recreationally. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised at how many of 
the people that I'm talking to forget how important it is to play. Yeah. Especially at a time like this, both in, both in a structured way, you know, whether it's board games, but it means connecting. Interpersonal play is different than video games. Mm -hmm. Although that can be done together, it's typically a solitary involvement. And spontaneous play, you know, I'm hearing about some families and some people who are having um, good dance parties. <laughs> uh, and you know, that, that too can be combined with connecting and getting work done. Chores, you know, what kind of music do you have on when you're getting the work done? And there, there is a current challenge with regards to connecting and touch. We're all missing that with each other. But it's important, you know, for those of us who have people at home or pets, that can be incredibly important touch. And then there, there is a connection that we have in projects and work, in ministry and, and in generosity and in serving. And to embrace the reality that um, we may not all give equally, but the call of our faith is equal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where the best part of people come out because generosity is its own reward. Mm -hmm. it doesn't, that's not a cost to us, it's a blessing to us. It's important also to focus on um, who God is. We know that in 1 John chapter four, uh, John refers uh, to God as love. Mm -hmm. And when so many of the questions that we have are unanswered, it's important to focus on the character of God and who he is and his love being reliable, dependable, available, predictable, and permanent. And that love is what we also offer each other. And to think about what it is that Jesus himself said was most important, which was to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, our neighbor as ourselves. It's an important question. What does love look like now? What does it look like today? What does it look like in this moment? You were talking about increased connection, you know, having those emotionally based conversations with family, praying together potentially. What do you do when you want to do that, but you're anticipating that your spouse or your kids are resistant to it? How do you handle that? Yeah, well, we, we know that um, extending an invitation is important. And that there is likely to be discomfort. There's natural discomfort when we move into something unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. And you might get uh, resistance or pushback. But in the example that you're giving, it may also mean shifting to, well, um, can I pray? And are you willing to listen? The risk um, in a family, for example, might be more adjusted to the physical risk. Could we sit on the couch together while we pray? Could we stand in a circle together and hold hands? And so it means thinking creatively about reducing what another family member might experience as a risk to something more manageable mm -hmm. and at the same time staying with that good goal. Yeah. And it may mean consistency. I, I may want to reapproach this or if it's like between a husband and wife in a family, it means potentially conversing. You know, I, I know this is not comfortable and reframing it as, you know, something that we can risk in together. Yeah. 
Yeah, Steve, one of the phrases that lives at Suncrest these days that means a lot to me is we say, life is on the other side of awkward, right? You, re you really do have to push through the awkwardness of a situation. And I love, I love that to say, hey, you can, you can pay attention to people's resistance and adjust your invitation accordingly, but it doesn't mean we just step back from it. Correct. So good. If we're having difficulty regulating our thoughts and feelings or controlling thoughts and feelings, we, we know that our anxiety is going to just continue to come up. And all of us will know some fear, some worry. All of us, to some degree, will be what ifing in our mind. What we need to be in recognition of is it excessive and do i find myself feeling even more anxious the more preoccupied i get mm -hmm. with my thoughts and feelings kind of snowballs on correct itself. yeah yeah also associated with anxiety is a, re a restlessness you know four different kinds of fatigue you know we just get tired on all levels we have difficulty concentrating, irritability. One author talked uh, about our vulnerability to cumulative annoyance, right? <laughs> We're around each other. We can get easily bugged. It can get stacked up. Mm -hmm. um, be aware of muscle tension, sleep disturbance. And also to, to realize that anxiety sometimes for some people comes out more in frustration and reactivity and anger. It's, it's a peculiar thing how um, available anger is when we're feeling stress and anxiety. But oftentimes it doesn't, it doesn't take much to trigger it. Mm -hmm. So how, how, what do you do when you, when you feel that? Um, identify it and from an interpersonal standpoint, it means communicating um, what's happening on the inside. You know, I, I find myself um, getting frustrated. It's one thing to identify it and announce it. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to suppress it, avoid it, or give into it, which also includes a recognition that we might need to give ourselves the freedom, you know, to go to a different part of the house mm -hmm. or to take a walk mm -hmm. or um, to think about, well, what is it that I'm, you know, really frustrated about? Oftentimes, when we calm down a bit, we, we recognize that our expectations of ourselves and other people in a situation like this are, are probably not very realistic. Yeah. I, you know, all of these pressures now associated with all of these limits. And there are some of us and, you know, people that we might work with or for who feel like, you know, the bar is higher now in some way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have to, produce and I have to, you know, take care, I have to teach the kids and, you know, suddenly I've got all of these pressures and it can be a, a real trap related to, you know, what we expect of ourselves and other people. And that, that can be a setup for these anger moments. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's interesting because, you know, you know, I feel this myself when sometimes if that anxiety wells up a little bit, they're, they're, and this is probably even like a, a spiritual uh, misunderstanding, right? Like you've heard the phrase, I'm going to teach on it this weekend, do not worry, right? And so I think, oh, I shouldn't worry. I, and the natural reaction is actually to press it back down, to suppress it, because I feel like I shouldn't feel that way. But I hear you saying, no, let it, let it come out in a healthy way, that announcement, that sharing of it, that naming of it, that giving your permission, self-permission to go take a walk to a different room. Right. Don't, yeah. don't suppress it. Yeah. The, 
the powerful thing that you're referring to is the recognition that in first john chapter four when the bible reminds us that perfect love casts out fear and that you've not yet been made perfect in love it means we get to come to the lord and each other as we are without being judged there's no amount of should or shouldnting that is going to change us and it is the lord himself and his love for us it's the one perfect love and it's a process mm -hmm. of experiencing him and loving each other in a way that enables us um, to be vulnerable and to disclose to say you know i'm having a hard time i'm going to tell you in advance because i don't want these things to overwhelm me or control me yeah it's a process and and this is why we need the lord and why we need each other yeah You said part of anxiety is irritability. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. I, I feel like um, in life, in family life, one of the greatest graces that we receive is when um, someone else uh, has a capacity to stay calm and not react to our irritability or reactivity. I mean, we have bad days. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, we need to get a turn um, being irritable or grumpy. Um, at the same time, irritability is one of those destructive avenues through which we push our anxiety. And so I've got fear and worry and I'm what ifing and you know, my, my mind is overwhelmed and I'm feeling that a number of things are out of control in my environment and on the inside. Mm -hmm. And that irritability can come across as being easily offended or easily bugged mm -hmm. or easily imposed on. And I, I think about the challenges of people working at home, right? and sounds from the other room and you know how do we actually get some things done when we're being interrupted or interfered with you know it it's not realistic um, to expect that we would achieve the same level and again these unrealistic expectations and the the frustrations the irritability the disappointments associated with not being able to do what I want to do um, can set us up to be hard to be around. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. I so if people can see this in themselves, that's awesome, and you can do some practices. But but what about when, when I'm like, I hear you, Steve. I got to tell you, my wife, my son, my daughter, they have that irritability thing. And what should I say to them about that? Sometimes um, it means a, uh, a family meeting and um, permission just to get it out. We're gonna spend 10 minutes crabbing. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, we're gonna ask one of the more difficult questions that um, people ask each other. What am I like to be around? Hmm. And to let, other people be truthful and to be able to kind of sit with it and recognize that although i might not have control over a lot i am responsible for my attitude and my disposition and how um, i treat others yeah and you know this is where we work at it together yeah so i'm, I'm picturing this conversation with my family right now and I say, trying to be open about it, what am I like to be around? And then one of my family members says something, and in my mind, I'm like, no, that's not, you're not right. I, I get defensive about it, right? Yeah. Um, so is, is it okay to say that? Or is it time <laughs> just to <laughs> say? Well, you know, of course, um, 
we don't need any training in defending ourselves <laughs> or wanting to be innocent or not found guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, it may mean the courage and the vulnerability of saying, are there some particular things that you're noticing that um, you can help me understand, right? Because even in asking, it means readying ourselves for some adjustment. Yeah. Because back to what we talked about before, is this day about getting love figured out? And um, who do I want to be in this? Yeah. Because in moving toward the importance of becoming resilient in all of this, how we treat each other um, in the next six months is going to have a lasting impact for good or for bad. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah.